Can anyone out there hear me? Just let us know in the chat. Yeah, 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 I can hear you. <laughs> and nothing's, nothing's awry. It would be a real shame if I did this whole recording for an hour and you couldn't hear a word I was saying. <laughs> yeah, I can hear you. I can hear yeah, you. I got it. If, um, if they want to just mute their mics. Um, yeah, so anyone that is here, I can't see you. I've got Ricky to the side who's looking at the screen, so he can see you and he can also see the chat. So if you can let us know that you can hear me okay and also if everyone yeah, could mute good. their own mics, that would be really good because then we won't get any noise interference. Yeah, so um, I'm in my studio here in Brookvale in Sydney, Australia, and we do, it's a working studio, it's a laneway, so we may get the occasional car noise. Uh, we've got builders next door, so we may get the occasional building sound, but that's real life, so I hope you'll stick with us through it. Um, I'm imagining that we will go for no more than an hour, if that. So uh, that's just to give you an idea of how long you will need to be here for. Uh, if you can't stick around, if you need to watch the replay, mm -hmm. I know a lot of you have said that you um, that because of the times it didn't really work. So uh, please know that we will be putting it, or we'll be sending you a link to watch this again. And you may uh, want to watch and paint along with me uh, and that's probably better to do in the replay. I think um, it's probably better that you listen if you're here live the first time around. Um, first of all, I just want to really welcome everybody from wherever you are, and I'd love to hear where you're from. So if you can put that in the chat, it would be great. Ricky will let me know. Um, Canada. We've got Canada here and maybe some, um, some time zones as well, like what time it is for you. Right. For me, it's 7.30, 5 to 8 in the morning. Just have my okay. coffee, thank God. Uh, I need that this morning. Nice, not nice. Um, I woke up with a little bit of a fire in my belly about today. Mm -hmm. And as often happens before I'm about to teach, I kind of get a real um, an idea of what it's really about. Right. And to say about mud and turning mud into magic. And I guess I was thinking about why I feel that mud is so important. And it is the layer, as I'll go through, that um, happens in a painting um, after we've painted for a bit and all the paint starts coming together and you get a little bit of a mess happening. But for me, mud is also an analogy for the parts of life that maybe we don't, maybe feel a bit uncomfortable. Maybe we, we don't, don't want to show all the time. Sorry, that might have gone louder. How's that, everyone? <laughs> um, maybe we, maybe um, we don't want to show all the time. It's those, you know, if we think of ourselves as 360 degrees as humans, often there's 180 that we like showing to the world that feels acceptable, that uh, looks okay, that we've been able to put a filter on, and then there's these parts of ourselves that, I guess over time we've been taught are probably not the parts that the world wants to see. And I believe that we need to put all, of us, all 360 degrees of ourselves out into the world, but also into our art. And it's in the mud that I think our paintings really come alive and they start speaking what we want to say. I don't know if you can hear that car. Uh, I also, like I'm really passionate that we all come into this life with a message, uh, particularly right now with the world the way it is. I feel really driven to speak my message and the way I speak is through art. And that's obviously the way that you speak as well. It's almost like we're compelled to say what we're here to say and the way that we do that is through paint. And I just don't really... Um, I think it's so important. It may not seem so important, but I think art and the way we express ourselves through art is so important. So if you're here and you feel like you have something to say, you want your art to speak what you have inside of you, but you haven't really been able to bring it out in the way that feels authentic or true or shows all of you, then I hope I've got something for you. Uh, Today's just the first lesson and I'll be going through how to make mud, um, also a little bit about bright colours and mud, um, and also my story. But before we begin, how's it all going over there, Ricky? Is everyone 
here and listening. Yeah. And oh, there's plenty from all over the world. We've got Norway. Um, there's some Can Canadians there. Saskatchewan. Saskatchewan. Wow, <laughs> Norway. Gosh, it's very late for you. Thank you for joining. Yeah. Um, and also, please let us know if you did the Messy Medal, if you are an alumni of the Messy Medal. I'd love to hear from you and know that you're there. I think you said Jan was there from New Zealand, from Australia, from up in um, Armadale. Yep, Jan was there. Yep. Awesome. Jan's Hi, Jan. It's good, <laughs> so good to see you here. New Jersey, Idaho, Boise, Boise, Idaho. <laughs> so lots of the states. Yeah, lots of this, uh, Australia. I saw uh, Janice. Janice, beautiful. Yeah. Hi. New Zealand, Melanie from New Zealand. Hi, from, hi, New Zealand. I'm actually a Kiwi, so welcome. So good to have you here. Diane from Atlanta, Georgia. Atlanta, Georgia, awesome. Robbie from Adelaide. Hello, Robbie. Hi, Robbie. Robbie's come and done, uh, she knows the studio. She's come and done some some uh, workshop here. Uh, yeah, cool. Well, I'll so get in. Newport, something about Newport. Oh, cool. Hey. Newport. Hi from Newport. Uh, that's Newport, Australia, I'm assuming. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> uh, so it was when I started being very serious about creating art, I, I'm inspired by colour, as I know a lot of you are and probably a lot of people that follow me are because my work is filled with colour. But when I really started to get serious about art, I found that I would be in two places. I would start my paintings off with a lot of saturated colours and I put a lot of colors down and it would be looking so beautiful. And I get this gorgeous piece of colorful art and it just kind of felt flat. Like strangely, when you have a lot of color, it can feel flat, but maybe it just didn't feel um, deep or meaningful. It was just this beautiful explosion of color without anything behind it. So there would be that. And actually, you know, I even sold pieces like that. So there, nothing against that, but I wanted it to say more. I wanted it to speak more of who I am. And I'm not all bright and cherry, as Ricky can probably tell you, all the time. I have many different layers and I wanted to put all of those layers into my art. So then I would start doing layers and putting more colour down and finding that my paintings would start looking a little bit messy. And I know that this happens to a lot of you because I see it here in my studio and I've seen it on my online courses. Um, it starts looking just ugly, to be honest. I think all paintings go through that stage where all the colours start to mix together and you get a little bit of a mess. And as soon as our, as artists, we get a little bit of a mess, we start feeling uncomfortable. And what I would do is I'd think, oh, okay, I've lost all the beautiful colours that I love. I'm just going to take this piece and put it aside and start again because that feels really comfortable to me. It feels comfortable to put beautiful bright colours down and to start off again. So I'd start a new canvas and again, once again, I'd start off and it would be beautiful bright colours and to get that depth, I'd keep going. And before you know it, it goes back into that kind of grey sludge mud, mud that again makes you feel like, I don't know what I'm doing. How do I get past the stage? How do I get my message out and also create a piece of work that feels beautiful that I want to look at? So once again, I put it aside and I'd start again. And I think that's where a lot of us are as artists. We have canvas after canvas after canvas that we start, we feel good about it. And when it starts getting that kind of icky feeling, when we start feeling a little bit uncomfortable because our art's no longer looking beautiful, we put them aside and start again. I like to draw an analogy to uh, when you first meet someone and you like them and you start going out with them and they're showing you all your best sides and you're showing them all your best sides. And it's great. It's kind of like that in love feeling. And then after a few months or a few years, uh, you start actually showing the real parts of you and that gets sticky. And often a lot of people will end relationships about then and begin again. And uh, I know when I was younger, you do that kind of over and over because actually diving into those uncomfortable bits, um, it was much better just to start again. 
uh, but actually that's not growing and you keep repeating the same mistakes. Until you're willing, willing to sit in the discomfort, you're not actually going to get any further or get past or learn or grow or show yourself to the extent that your relationship can grow. And for me, art's a bit like that. We've got to, for me, for my art to speak, I've got to sit in those moments I've got to sit in the discomfort and I've got to move through the discomfort. So that's what mud really is for me. Uh, I didn't say it before. I'm Denny. I'm an abstract expressionist artist from Sydney uh, and my studio is here in Brookvale. I run uh, in-person and online workshops and uh, retreats and um, intensives and I've worked with artists from all over the world and I find a, the similar thing, whether you're a beginner, whether you're an emerging artist and often uh, professional artists, experienced artists, they get really uncomfortable with mud. And I guess I'm a little bit different because I love sitting in the mud. I'm prepared to uh, sit in the mud and see what I can create with it. Uh, it took a little while. It took a little while of being uncomfortable. And if you have taken a workshop with me, then you will have heard me say that I'm here to expand your ability to sit in the discomfort because I believe as artists, it's kind of like a diamond uh, that needs the pressure and the time and the patience to become a diamond. Uh, it's That's how I, I liken to art. And again, I think that if we've got messages to, stay, to say and you're not getting there, then this is where, imagine if this is just the thing that you're missing in your art, that you could get to another side of discomfort to create art that you've never created before. That's my wish. That's what I want to bring to you today. Are we going there, Ricky? All good. Okay, well, I'm going to, first of all, I want to explain a little bit about mud and how you get it. On your painting. I know I had someone here um, in my studio the other day and they were a little bit unsure about exactly what mud was in a painting. So I'm just going to demonstrate that. Uh, so I hope you can see this. I've just got a bit of paper and my palette here, my wet, wet palette, and I'm just going to put some colours onto my palette. Again, this was where I would start uh, when I first was a bit more serious and started taking um, my painting a little bit more seriously I would just start off with really saturated colors so that one there is Matisse green gold yeah. a lot of the ones I use are Matisse sorry about that there you go uh, this is my typical palette so just so that you know I, I do use a lot of these colors there's quinacridone magenta I'm just putting out what I would normally so that you can see exactly what happens on my palette. Uh, I'm going to put on there. I often, and I do often stay, start my paintings this way. I start with a few colours on my palette that are saturated that I then mix. And I start with a lot of transparency and some opaques as well. So this one here is light let me just get my glasses out so I can tell you. Light blue violet. It's a Liquitex. Mm -hmm. Some of that on there. So I've got some green, some pink. Get some yellow out. This is, uh, I just grabbed a whole lot of tubes from my shelves. This is Atelier Yellow Ochre. And often again, like that one is opaque. I'm going to put out a transparent yellow oxide with that. So you can see I'm getting a bit of a rainbow on my palette. I'm going to put some darker green. This is olive uh, hooker's green, this one is, from Matisse. Just to get some deeper green in there. I often use greens instead of blues, but I bring in the lilac. That's hooker's green from Matisse. And my all-time favourite that you would have seen me paint with a lot, a fluoro pink. So I'll get some of that onto the palette as well. 
all those colors, look at them all, and I've got white on there as well. So this is where I typically start, just lots of color. Uh, and I'm not thinking in those early stages of painting, I'm not being too concerned with what color I've got on there. I just want to have lots and see where I can go. So, you know, if I, I would start my paintings and I'd have these, you know, beautiful, bright colors that would come out, you know, always, always pink. I think, you know, a lot of when I started, the reason why I, I would question the depth in my paintings is that there would be a lot of pink and pink can be a color that feels a bit hollow when on its own. But, um, you know, you put all these colors down, you've got lovely yellows and when the yellows and the pinks hit, they become beautiful oranges and you'd get the greens in there and, you know, your paintings are, this is where I'd be, you know, they, they, they did look beautiful. They felt like uh, what I wanted them to feel like in terms of them being kind of organic shapes and a little bit botanical, but there was just bright, bright, bright with nothing to contrast it with. So then once you keep going for a while and your palette starts coming together and your colors start blending on your palette, let me just put a little bit of everything in here. Getting all these colors together, a little bit of the green, some pink. You know, once they start blending, then you start getting this which is flat and looks a little bit like dirt. And then if we keep going with this and we start blending them together, ultimately the same thing happens. All our brights start to fade into each other. And while you might have pops of color going, once you keep going and keep going, chances are, that your painting starts to look a little flat and it's uncomfortable. You know, it's like, oh, I've just got mud now. What do I do with it? And so often that's exactly what people ask me. What do I do when I get to that mud stage? So ultimately that's what mud is. It's when all the colors come together and there's no depth. You're just getting that one dimensional color. You've lost all the beautiful pops and you just get brown mess. Uh, if you've seen me on YouTube, I did a short um, about when I was a kid and I did used to do this. We used to have like Neapolitan ice cream where you'd have pink and um, white and yellow we actually had like a rainbow ice cream where it would have all the colors mixed together and loving color even from when I was little I would just get all my bowl of ice cream and just wonder what amazing uh, psychedelic color I could create create from all of these colors that were in my ice cream bowl and I'd mix them all together being so excited with what was going to come out of it and in the end it pretty much looked like this it was just brown or grayish um, goo <laughs> and it was just so disappointing and I think that that's where we get to as artists when you're excited about color and then you end up with these kind of flat colors it is just a bit soul destroying but you know the thing about mud is that it's fertile you grow things from it so when I actually decided to bring all those canvases out that have been piling up and try and work out how do I bring the color back? How do I balance this and the color? Everything changed for me. Everything changed. Like my art started to get a lot more noticed. Um, I started to get a lot more people wanting to know um, who I was and I'd get a lot more of my art selling. So I realized that, oh, I just need to sit with it and I need to be okay with there being some kind of ugly bits in my paintings that can't all be bright and beautiful. I also need the ugly bits to show. And funnily enough, it was the ugly bits that spoke more of parts of me. Um, it's when my painting started to have meaning for me. It felt like my meaning was coming across through all the bits that were uncomfortable for me. So I hope I can show you this. I'm going to demonstrate also on 
just got a question. Yeah. On the um, surface you're painting. Oh, so this is today I'm painting completely on watercolor paper. This is Fabriano. It's about a 300 gram. Uh, the wall, I've got paper up as well, but it's probably not as thick. I quite like using paper, particularly when I'm demonstrating, because it's I, I, I let it go. I let things go more when I'm on paper because I don't um, I don't attach to it as much. So if it's canvas, I kind of have it in my head that it's probably going to be finished one day. And even though I like to let go of outcome, it still creeps in. So when I'm demonstrating in particular, I use paper. Um, watercolor paper, um, 300 gram, and you could probably frame it and sell it as well. I'm just asking, is it gessoed? It's not gessoed. The only time I gesso anything is uh, when I'm doing little sixes and I'm taping up, and that's simply so that the paint doesn't bleed underneath the tape. Otherwise, I leave everything ungessoed. And I also, uh, another question that you may be wondering is anything that I mix with is water. I don't use glazing mediums. I just use water, and I use quite a bit of it um, to mix all my paints. So, yes, if you have any questions, please just um, keep them going in the chat, and, and Ricky will... We'll give me them as we go. Um, the wet palette. You've done a video on the wet palette. It's online. I do. Um, any resources. There are a few things that I've got out there that you can get. So anything that I don't cover today, um, how to do the white palette, how I think I've got a, something out there about three ways to get unstuck if you're in a, um, the midst of your painting and you don't know where to go. There, if you, um, there is some videos out there or you can maybe just email me and I'll send them to you. Uh, there's also the YouTube channel where I do uh, a lot of demonstrations, a lot of palettes, uh, I love sharing, you know, if you've got any questions, I will answer all the questions that you give me. Um, if you know me, if you've been in my class, there is nothing I will not share or tell. I don't believe in that. I think that this, um, anything that I've learnt from other artists or in my practice, that I just want to share it so that it makes your work better. Um, brands of paint. Brands of paint. I'm here in Australia. So look, my favorite favorite is golden. It's not always available or easy to get here um, or it's expensive. Uh, I use a lot of Matisse structure. I prefer the structure to flow. Uh, it's, and I love their uh, transparency. Um, I use Liquitex. Uh, Liquitex have a beautiful fluoro colors. I use the Liquitex sprays and uh Liquitex, uh, there's a summer atelier as well. Um, I'm hoping somebody in the States is going to, one of my friends in the States is going to send me some some gorgeous um, gorgeous paints that you have over there that I can't get here, like Nova. Uh, but Matisse is probably my one that I use the most, both in my workshops and in my paintings. Cool. Uh, okay. That's it for now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put some brights up onto this and then we'll slowly work with the muds and with the brights to show you how I think the muds actually work better when you bring them in. But typically I start off with brights. So that's what I'm going to do here. Uh, and typically I start off with pink and my water bottle. I love my water bottle. So, you know, there's nothing that lights me up more than getting these beautiful gorgeous kind of pinks on to the canvas they just you know I always say you know do things that really light you up and for me pink really lights me up it just is such a great way to start off a painting for me because I know I'm going to want to keep going and for whatever reason, as artists, it can be uncomfortable to paint. We all sort of make excuses. So whatever you can do to get into the studio, um, whatever it is that lights you up enough, then do that to start with. Always start with your favourite thing. Um, and that that's it for me, just these beautiful pink colours. Uh, I don't have any outcome in my head when I'm painting. I'm just thinking about or. Oh, I just want to get some gorgeous colours onto the canvas. And pink and green is just a match made in heaven. 
I also see I use a lot of water moving around the painting. And already it's looking like a bright explosion of colour. Might bring in some deeper, some deeper greens there too. We got any of the uh, messy middle alumni on there, Ricky? Yes, uh, Janice, uh, Jesse. Oh, Jesse. Awesome. Hi, Jesse. Uh, also, see Trisha Tharpe. Hi, yeah. Trisha. We got Christo Tharpe. Um, I think Josie Kaiser was there from Germany. Oh, yep. yep. Just adding to a little bit of red to my palette just to bring something else in with that pink so that when I hit it, it's got that other real nice punch to it. Again, straight out of the tube. These are all completely saturated colors. Oh, Kerry Newman's there too. Hi, Kerry. <laughs> Hi, Kerry. Nice to see you. Where's Kerry? Kerry's... Um... Michigan, aren't you, Kerry? So lovely having you all in my studio. North Carolina. There you go. North Carolina. So look, that is a really typical place where my paintings start. They're bright. They're really bold. I've used saturated colors. There's not a lot of mud going on. Um, and look, while they look beautiful, they kind of are a bit one-dimensional. And I sat here for the longest time. It was... Um, Look, to be honest, I probably created paintings like this for years before I realised that I needed something else with them. Um, and as I said, it's not like I didn't get to the mud stage. I did, but I would not like them so much that I'd just keep putting them aside. And um, <laughs> I didn't have a studio at the time. I was working out of home. And it gets to the point where you've just got so many paintings that aren't going anywhere that um, you either, you're either going to give it in or you're going to find a way to work through it. Uh, so I'm going to now go to uh, making some mud. Now, this is where your canvases go to when you create mud unintentionally. I now create mud intentionally. So I put all the colours together. I get them all on the palette so that I do create a really... I guess somewhat flat color. It's there for you. It's flat. Uh, if you've taken a course with me, I kind of call it a little bit of a dead color. It's like it sucks up all the color from around it. So this is intentional mud for me. And the beautiful thing about intentional mud is what it does when it's next to the most beautiful bright colors. It just helps them sing. So while mud can happen accidentally it can also be something beautiful that you can bring into your work that will take it to a whole different level if you use it intentionally yeah. just, that's paper right that's the same paper you're painting on uh, this is the same it's it is um, a little bit lighter so the quality isn't as good as the one that i've got here on the desk but it is just watercolor paper okay. i often put this watercolor paper up in my studio because it um and enables me just to experiment like I'm doing now. Um, but I also, you know, if I want to do anything with it, I don't know if you saw my post on some cushions um, that I got done that were really beautiful. And they were just um, paintings that I'd done on paper 
that really the paper wasn't good enough to sell, but I was able to take the paintings and change them to um, take the photo of a painting and then I was able to get it made up into a cushion and they're really beautiful. So even if you do have work on paper that you're experimenting with, uh, you can use it. There's always different uses for it. I'm not one to waste. So I hope you can see that in the camera, the way that the mud just really helps the pink to sing. Um, and I'll demonstrate it on this just to give you a bit more of an idea. Okay, just a question on what's your difference between experimenting and a finished piece? Uh, my difference on experimenting and a finished piece. Well, I guess surface for a start. Uh, when I'm uh, painting on this kind of paper, it like, to frame this would be huge, number one, because of the size of it. And um, for paper, it's really got to go behind glass. So that in itself would cost too much. So when I'm painting, unless I'm doing smaller pieces, when I'm painting this size, it is about experimentation for me. I like not having the feeling that it's going to go anywhere because it allows me to loosen up even more so that when I do work on canvas um, that I've let go and I'm bringing in a different kind of freedom. I'm um, part of the idea for me of the sitting in the discomfort and bringing everything to a painting is I let go of my final, I, I let go of a finished product. Um, and this, by doing this, it trains me to do that. Um, I'll also get canvases that I have nearly finished but don't feel quite right, and I'll start all over again. I'll let go of all the things I like that were there before to create something even deeper. Um, because for me, the depth of work comes from the process it takes to get there rather than feeling like you want to get to a finished product. I liken it. I liken it a little bit to music. When you play music, you don't want the song to end. It's about listening to it. And for me, painting is a little bit like that. It's about the process that I put into it um, so that when it does finish, when the song does finish, I feel like everything has been sung in that song. I've given all my emotions to it without feeling like I needed to get to the end of the, to the finish line too early. I hope that makes sense. Uh, so I just wanted to come back to the down here, yep. uh, putting a little bit of mud on here because I want to demonstrate exactly how, can you see that? Does that look like mud in the camera, Ricky? Yeah, kind of. It's got a little bit of pink to it, hasn't it? Well, it's got a bit of everything because all of the colours are in that. But what I wanted to show you was how beautiful it comes up when you put that next to it or when you put that next to it. They really sing when you've got these gorgeous colours that happen next to the mud. The colours sing even more. Let's get a cloth. Get that off my fingers. Uh, another thing that I use is oil pastel. So you see the oil pastel and what that does over the mud. It just jumps out at you. You get a different colour. There's a beautiful thick magenta. And that cuts right through the mud. There's the, the green there. Oops. This isn't quite as good an oil pastel. And it's a little bit earthier. It looks good with mud, but doesn't jump out as much. But you'll notice all the really bright colours really sing next to the mud. Mm -hmm. um, and essentially that's what I'm doing on my canvas. And to get those really bright colours, and I'm asked that a lot, it's they're fully saturated. And I won't always work with a fully saturated palette. I often do in the early layers. If you're... Um, if you're coming back tomorrow for lesson two, I'm going to talk about cohesion in your palette because that can take this to a whole new level. You can't just have your brights and your muds. It's also important to have a palette that speaks to each other and looks like it's been made um, 
looks like it's been uh, that that is your palette. That it's not just a whole lot of tubes that you've spread onto a onto a palette and put together. So that's what tomorrow is going to be about. It's about creating some cohesion. But first, I'm just going to come back here. Sorry, another question. Yep. Um, Diane's asking, uh, can you paint over acrylic? Uh, acrylic over oil pastel? Um, I do all the time. I often leave my pastels, um, I, I often put pastels on the last layers, but I also put them into a painting because I like what they do. So I've got this painting here and I want to kind of exaggerate some of the leaf shapes. And so I will at some point bring in oil pastel at this point. And this is fairly early, but they just stand out so beautifully. Uh, I'm just going to put something else on here so I can start this looking a little bit more like a... Uh, I think, sorry, I just put Payne's Grey onto my palette. Again, this is how I work in the early layers. I'm not, I'm not creating a cohesive palette palette at this point but i will that will come into it tomorrow i'm just getting more on there There's another question there from Rosalind. she's asking about the how do you seal the pastel yeah i let my pastels dry naturally and they don't always completely dry but i find if i leave them a few days um that they will harden and then i can put a varnish straight over the top of them mm -hmm. as so often happens for me. If I put in some kind of container, then it starts looking more like what I want it to. Uh, and I do that kind of loosely, and I love having lots and lots of drips going on in there. Uh, I, I've used oil um, sticks and uh, I'm very impatient. I do paint pretty fast, so I do know that and the oil sticks take so long to dry. I love the feeling of them. They're so thick and buttery. My feeling is that there will be a time that I will explore oils more, kind of figuring maybe I might get less impatient as I get older. Um, but And I love what they do because they're so rich and they're so thick. But at this point, I've really just looked at oil sticks. Um, I'm also very messy. Um, and I can just imagine that bringing those sort of things into the studio will um, create a whole another level of, of, of mess for Ricky to clean up. Oh, I love it. <laughs> um, Anna's just asking, can art be transient? Can art be transient? As in, can you create it and then let, let, and let, then let it go? Is that what you mean? Um, um, not sure. I'm, I'm going to assume you mean that, as in it just kind of meanders and goes where it wants to and that you can let it go and, it cre and, and you create it into something else. I've got canvases that I have been painting and repainting for 10 years. Um, I very loosely hold on to my work. Uh, there's something about that because I change and evolve. Um, my work changes and, and evolves. And, you know, I love creating finished pieces that sell, but I also have a feeling of needing my paintings to speak layer upon layer. And so I do have a few that I have lying around that are exactly that for me. They are something one day and they might turn into something the next day. Frustrates the hell out of Ricky, but. Every five minutes. <laughs> Is that what you meant? Um, Let us know in the chat if that's what you were sure. referring to. So again, here I've got all the brights and I'm now creating some intentional mud, which is this bit. Because for me, again, I've got the beautiful botanicals and I need it to also have 
the layers that are not so pretty. So it was all gorgeous and dripping and lovely shapes. But for me, that's just never quite enough. I need it to also have the mud that gets the other bits speaking. And I'll also, as I said before, bring in oil pastels just to kind of give those little pops that bring back, that go into the mud and bring back those kind of really lovely little bits that also happen. And I said, yeah, like that piece is beautiful, but eventually a person gets bored and you mess it up and create something new. Yes. Um, Julia is asking, um, how do you balance your experimenting and earning a living? It's such a challenge. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, I do a lot of these experimental pieces, which are for me, they enable me to be looser um, so that when I'm creating a body of work, then I can be a little bit more intentional about creating finished work. Uh, so I guess it's not, I don't ever want to feel like I'm creating work to sell. Um, when I've done that in my life, it's like everything closes in and I get, um, it, it's, I've, and this is just for me. I know it's different for everybody else, but for me, if I feel like I'm creating work just for that, it doesn't speak. It suddenly just becomes something that I want, that um, people want to buy because it looks pretty. Um, and I want my art to say, and I, I'm not saying that my art doesn't, lots of people tell me it looks beautiful and it's bright and it's joyful. Um, it has to say something to me. Otherwise it doesn't have that same meaning. So uh I will create art as uh, in a series that I'm hoping do sell, um, but the rest, a lot of the times I'm doing this so that I can expand my abilities without the thought of a finished product. I hope that answers your question. A bit like muscle memory that you're doing too. Yeah, like, and, and also, you know, I, I teach, but I teach as soon as I find something out, as soon as I discover something, it's just kind of my, it, one of my archetypes is teaching. I love passing it on. It lights me up. And if you've taken a workshop with me, you'll know this. It lights me up so much to take an artist um, onto the next level of their work. It just is um, something that really is, I'm here to do. So, um I have found that the students that work with me uh, are, I can really move them. It's, it's one of my superpowers is just to kind of see where you're stuck, see what's the block and help you get through that stage. So uh, that helps me in itself. Teaching really helps me to let go of the outcome. Um, quick one, Wendy asked, asking, do you take photos of work in black and white to look at the value? Yeah. Absolutely. So I'm showing you today mud and just different ways to help the mud sing and different ways of using um, intentional mud and also I hope reframing what mud is in your work. Uh, tomorrow I'm going to go into uh, more colour cohesion in a palette and the way that I make my palettes up. Um, and I definitely don't sit and do colour swatches. I don't have the patience for that. So I hope you'll join me tomorrow for more of that. Um, but in uh, my practice, um, I have a whole list of different things that I move through in order to um, see what's working in my pieces and what's not working. And a big one is to photograph your work, to see if you've got the lights and the darks working because uh, you're going to notice a painting from across the road, a room or from a, across the road of sitting in a gallery, it's going to be black and white to you. So you're going to only really see the real differences in the darks and lights. Um, and that's what taking your work to photographs and putting it into black and white will do. It'll give you an idea if it's just um, all mud with nothing that's standing out um, or whether you've got enough uh, dynamics in there and we will go into that a little bit on day three uh, so hopefully you'll be here on day three for more of that question on the water bottle from Evie over in Scotland in the UK 
He's asking about the spray, uh, the fine nozzle. Is it a fine nozzle? It is quite a fine nozzle. That said, because this is so big, I got uh, one that isn't quite well, it's, it's, it sprays out a lot of water. When I'm working this big, everything moves. So you would have noticed that, you know, I've got big paint brushes that I'm using rather than if I'm working on smaller paintings, you know, I will go down to this. Uh, and same with my water bottles. Um, the spray comes out a lot. And even with this, because the paper's not great, it's not probably dripping as much as it would. Um, if it was a canvas piece, uh, but it's enough to show you and to demonstrate. Uh, but I, this is virtually in my hand. I've got a paintbrush in one hand and I've got a bottle in the other, um, no matter what I'm doing, because I use so much water in my work. So there you go. That's where I'm getting to with this painting tomorrow. Uh, sorry, today. I'm going to keep going on it tomorrow, but I'm loving these areas, they're just, they're dirty. Um, and you've got these beautiful brights, but it's these dirty areas that light me up. And it's because of how the bright colours sit with it. If it was just all this bright, it just wouldn't have the grit, I think. I think it's grit that mud brings. Uh, somehow or other, this speaks to me of my, of of because I liken these kind of big, beautiful bot botanical paintings that I do, um, I liken them to the spirit of a woman, <laughs> um, you know, us being, uh, being wild and free and uncontained. So even when I have a container, I like lots of bits to be out. I love some of the flowers sometimes to be growing in a strange place because that's what I want for um, for me, for my daughter, for, for, for women who have something to say, I think it's time for us to feel a bit um, freer. So that's what those brights do for me. But this speaks to our depth. This speaks to kind of the, the messages that aren't so uh, pretty that we're here to deliver. So I need both. And like I say, since I worked out how to work with both, it's taken my paintings to a different level. So I hope that helps you. Uh, as I said, tomorrow, um, oh, I wanted to see as, if Jessie's around and if Jessie will come on and say hi. Jessie, if you're around, say hi. If not, it's all good. I'm we'll here. Hi. Hi. Um, oh, hey. Here I am. Do you want to go live? <laughs> What's happening? Sure. <laughs> there you are. All the way over in Christchurch, New Zealand. Okay, so I'm not going to be able to hear what Jesse says, so you're going to, you can maybe relate. Um, hi, Jesse. I just want to, Jesse was oh. um, a beautiful artist in New Zealand and um, she's travelled all the way from New Zealand to uh, work with me at, on a retreat and she's also did my beta version of the Messy Middle. Uh, Jesse, what sort of, can everyone else hear Jesse on the call, Ricky? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, you're a bit quiet. Anybody? I can, I can hear you. Can anyone else see Jesse? Anybody else can hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Jesse. Nice you. to see you again. Um, so, Jesse, I just I wanted mean, you to kind of maybe speak to what um, art you were creating um, before we met. And are oh, you going to give me the headphones? No, 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 you should be able to hear. I'll turn it up. <laughs> oh, there you are. <laughs> I might get a bit of feedback. Be careful, I'll catch up some more. Okay. Yeah, Jesse, can you just let everyone know just a, a sort of a, because you've worked with me before, it'd be kind of nice to speak to um, your art and how it's changed since you've been working with more the uncomfortable bits that I refer to as mud and mess. Okay. Do I start with what I was doing before? I yeah. yeah tell you? us a bit about the art you were creating before. <laughs> so I, my art was acrylic pouring before I found Denny online. Um, been doing it for five years. It was, you know, it came out of whatever. Uh, so here's a piece right here. Fluid art, you know, nothing with a brush. Uh, really have absolutely no uh, real experience with brushes and definitely not abstract painting. So, um, yeah, I've been doing that for a few years. And then at the beginning of this year, I just really felt something sh shifting in me to change and wasn't sure where I was going. So um, 
I thought I'll look at those few artists that I really follow because I love what's in their work and see if anyone's doing courses. Uh, hey, presto. Uh, <laughs> Denny was doing the Messy Middle then. So I signed up for the online course and then just already my life changed after like two days of just doing smalls. Um, and then when I went on to the retreat, that was like life changing. Incredible. Nothing boring. Yeah. <laughs> How was it? Because I know that the work you were doing before was really beautiful, pouring art. Um, and I know that that there were challenging times of sitting in that kind of messy middle stage in a painting. How did that feel, changing to the, the way you painted? Um, that was really hard. Having no, like I've never understood the whole concept of abstract. Why do you put marks on there? Like you never see them. Why do you do all those layers? You know, I have done some kind of dabbling with paint um, years ago, palette knives and stuff. But basically, like you were saying earlier, I'd get to a certain stage and be like, well, that didn't turn out. So <laughs> off you yeah. go. Because I always came with a preconceived idea of what I was wanting to paint. So to paint, I think the pouring actually helped a little bit because you had very little control over where it was going. You just had to kind of control what you thought looked beautiful in it. And so starting out, yeah, it was it was really tricky. But I, I, I really started to get then the whole thing of putting something down so you can respond to it. All that lingo, that never meant anything to me before. <laughs> um, Pretty pretty hard getting into the stuck in the middle. So I think it's why I like doing the smalls so much because they didn't really have a middle. We just had yeah. this great time with these little ones. Um, on the actual online course, I got super stuck in the middle and just went through waves of frustration and hope and more frustration and a little bit more hope. And then at the end, I was like, well, I, I don't hate it, but I don't like it. And that's where I was left with that piece. <laughs> and then the course finished for me, so I was like, oh, I'm not quite sure where I'm going. So I think I think the uh, the universe was saying you need the retreat because it all changed there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but there, um, um, you know, and that is the thing is that sitting in that middle bit and in that mud bit and being able to negotiate your way through it and finding ways to get yourself out of it, it feels to me like we all want to rush out of that stage. Um, certainly I see it all the time in my workshops and I saw it in the messy middle. It was like, how much do I need to sit here? How quickly can I make my way through this? And it's such a good analogy for, for life because the more we do sit in that, the more we develop our paintings and the more that there's this history that is built up in our work that speaks our message even more and even deeper. So I, I can't hear you too well, Jesse, but thank you for, for sharing that. She's still there. You're welcome. <laughs> Thanks, Krista. <laughs> Tomorrow we're going to come back. We're nearly on an hour. So if there's any questions, then put it into the chat so Ricky can let me know. I hope I've kind of given you an idea of uh, working with mud and uh, how you can start to make mud work for your paintings. Uh, tomorrow, as I said, I'll go a lot more into palettes and getting a, a cohesion in your palettes. Um, but I'd love to hear from anyone out there whether um, what's your biggest takeaway for today, whether that has helped you at all, um, how you feel about the painting and, and where it's headed or anything that you have. Um, I'll answer the questions tomorrow. Um, I thank you for coming and being online with me. Uh, I hope and I do know I've got more to give you over the next two lessons. Um, I hope you'll come back because, like I say, it's it lights me up to pass on whatever I can. And the biggest thing I find with artists is they have so much to say, but part of what they have to say is sitting in um, the bits that feel uncomfortable. And if I can give you anything, it's the importance of those messy, muddy bits. So I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you for joining me. Thanks, Ricky, over there. Okay. There's a couple of little questions. Oh, okay. We'll do the questions before we go. And, uh, there's mostly about brushes and stuff. Oh, okay. Yep. I'll answer those for you tomorrow. Okay. All right.
Uh, and this will be available on replay. So if you want to rewatch it, or for anyone that's um, not been able to make it today, we'll be we'll be putting in, um, sending you a link to it pretty soon. Yeah, as soon as I can. I have to convert it. Yeah. Thank you, All right. All right. Have beautiful nights, days, if, wherever Thank you are you in the world. I really appreciate you being here. And that's all, folks. <laughs>